Not today. <laughs> now, the season of Christmas is upon us. Are you guys excited for Christmas? How many of you guys are excited for Christmas? I firmly believe this is the best year, uh, the time of the year, minus shoveling snow out of the driveway a few days ago. Uh, but I'm super excited for this year, for this year Christmas. By the way, if you guys need Bibles, we have guest servants who will come. Just raise your hand and we'll, we'll love to give you a Bible. We haven't met. My name is Johnny and I'm one of the pastors here at Calvary. And I'm super excited to teach the Bible this morning. Uh, today we're kicking off our Christmas series here at uh, church, so if you would, join me in the book, book of Luke, chapter 2, the Gospel of Luke. Now, while you, while you get there, I want to tell you a story of something that happened to me a few weeks ago. About three weeks ago, I was driving home from the office. It was about 4.30 p.m., and so I get on my car. I, I play some Christmas music, which, by the way, I'm very curious. How many of you guys start Christmas before Thanksgiving. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Now, I want everybody to look around. This is what's wrong with America right here. <laughs> I gave in a little bit earlier than I wanted. I got home one day early November to Michael Bublé's Christmas album, playing on the Alexa device. So I did what any loving husband would do. I donated Alexa to Goodwill. Anyways, I was driving home from uh, that Friday. I take Highway 61. I take a left on I-10. When all of a sudden, this deer comes sprinting out of nowhere. By the way, I firmly believe that deer have this weird attraction to fast vehicles, right? It's like they talk amongst each other. They go, hey, here comes a vehicle at 60 miles per hour. This is my time to cross. So he hits my car, and all I see is this enormous deer flying in slow motion before my eyes. And on my rear view mirror, I see this deer looking at me like, I'm going to find you, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> he looks at me, and then he runs into the woods. So I get out of the car, and I see my entire bumper destroyed, and, and the hood was dented. Very inconvenient. Now, you need to understand, I am a city guy. And up until three weeks ago, I was an avid animal activist. <laughs> but that afternoon, something changed, ladies and gentlemen. So I call my wife and I say, babe, babe, tell your mom we're not having roasted turkey for Thanksgiving anymore. So I wanted to show you a picture of my Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> we really enjoyed it. It's a fake picture, by the way. It's not real. I don't want to get canceled. <laughs> now, I say this because much like this deer that I didn't see coming, sometimes life has a way of throwing these unexpected destructions or distractions, like unforeseen, expect or unforeseen inconveniences. Maybe you didn't hear deer, but maybe you're navigating through difficult memories during this Christmas season. Maybe you're going through a hard season. And it's, it's in these moments we need to refocus on what truly matters. That's why we've titled this Christmas series, It's About Jesus. It's About Jesus. Now, isn't it interesting that your view of Christmas evolves as you grow older? Let me tell you what I mean by that. When I was a kid, I was very excited for Christmas because it was this sort of culmination of a year's worth of waiting. Like if you have kids, you probably know they're so excited for gifts. They're so excited for this. And then when I was a broke college student, all I can think about is how to buy 13 gifts with $37.55. And then I got married, and Christmas seems to revolve around city girls falling in love with local farmers, <laughs> which I don't get. I have, I have no idea why that's a thing. But it's, but it's really easy to get caught up in the Christmas chaos. In fact, it's not uncommon for me as a pastor to, to hear people say, hey, Christmas just snuck up on me. Why? Because when something becomes so familiar, we start to lose our wonder. Once we celebrate it with so much excitement, now we don't even notice. That's why my prayer this morning, as we navigate through this biblical story, as we read scripture, as we gather here together collectively to listen to God's word, I pray that your heart will be surprised by things in this story that you maybe never seen, 
seen or, or before, or maybe things that you haven't seen in a very long time. So we're going to read Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And one of the things that I think is very helpful when we study scripture is that I want you to enter into the story and activate your imagination. I want you to be there 2,000 years ago in this little, little town of Bethlehem. And I want you to imagine being around this time. So I hope that God uses this to reactivate your awe of God. So here we go, starting in verse 1 of Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And verse 3, and everyone went to their town to register. So Joseph also went up to the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While the time came, or the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to the, his firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in a cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Can you imagine that? There's no room for the Savior and the Messiah of the world. Verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Verse 12, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in a cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appear with the angel, praising God and saying, let's notice this, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Let's pray as we entrust our time together again. Dear God, we pray once again for this time together, for this next few min minutes as we navigate, as we are exposed to the reality of Jesus' birth. Lord, this changed the course of history, Lord, so as we navigate and engage with your word, I pray that you will speak to us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Lord, transform us today. And we pray all these things in your name. And we all say, amen. Now, last Sunday afternoon, I found myself in downtown Chicago with my wife and her family. And we went to this Chris Kindle market, which is a Christmas market that is held in the city every year. It's kind of sort of the holiday show that we have here uh, in Muscatine, with the exception of the I ones are actually nice. <laughs> so, uh, and so... It was wonderful, especially walking shoulder to shoulder with hundreds of people all bundled up like penguins in a 25 degree weather. But what I found very interesting is that it was people, it was packed with people who were getting in line for the most random things like a pickle ornament or potato pancakes. And as I'm shuffling through shoulder to shoulder, I'm thinking in that moment, I was very cynical, I was really hypocritical, pray for me, I am in counseling. So I was thinking, Many here probably are in tune into what Christmas is all about. I mean, it's in the name, people, right? Yet there's the irony in Christmas. People who might not even believe in Jesus are out here essentially celebrating his birthday. Now, it's a bit sad, really, how superficial Christmas has become. Let me give you an example. It's like if I invited you, all, all of you, for my birthday party, and I was very excited, but then everyone else started celebrating each other and forgot that I was there. You'd be probably exchanging gifts, eating cake, and I'm here in the corner opening my own presents. It's important to remember why we gather to, to keep the focus on Jesus. That's why this morning, if you're taking notes, I'd love for you to write them down. I'm gonna offer three main purposes to the Christmas story, and I hope that this reality impact your faith, because when we come to church, we don't come just to hear some abstract realities or abstract theological concepts. We are here gathered to be transformed by the power of God's word. So, number one. Jesus came to dwell among us. Jesus came to dwell among us. Now, between the last book of the Old Testament, which is Malachi, 
and the, new, and the book of the New Testament, the first book, which is Matthew, there is a big gap. There's a span about, about 400 years during which there was no recorded divine intervention from God. So I want you to put it into perspective. Let's say the United States, from the signing of the Declaration of Independence in what year? Okay, only a, a few proud Americans. 1776. Until today, imagine that time until today with, with no, with a, without a single presidential address, there's no laws passed, no amendments, nothing. So generation born and gone, empires rising and falling, all without a prophetic voice or a miracle in sight. Just waiting and watching history unfold. I remember the time I sent Ashley, my wife, who was just a friend back then, a nice handwritten letter a few years ago, and I put on my heart on this letter. Like I told her how I felt about her, and I want to get to know her. And and so I was super excited when I sent out the letter. Now weeks went by, and nothing came back. And I started to think maybe she lost my number, my address. Maybe she can measure up. She feels like she cannot measure up to my godliness. I'm thinking all these things. Maybe she's not interesting, I don't know. But after a while, I came to find out that she actually had sent out a letter and he had gotten lost in the mail. But if I'm honest with you, and I might be overreacting, but those weeks felt like an eternity. Now imagine the people of Israel waiting 400 years for any type of divine communication. And when hope seemed like a distant memory, the divine narrative resumed with the most profound intervention possible, which we just read, the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. And this reality is what we will call the incarnation. Don't worry about it, but this is the act of assuming flesh. And I love what John 1.14 says. The word, referring to Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Now, I love how the message paraphrases this verse. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. He moved around us to be our neighbor. Now, the word that John uses for dwelling literally means to pitch a tent or the verb to tabernacle. Now, if you think that word, wouldn't you think, okay, I'm making some connections John wants us to figure it out and look back at the tabernacle in the Old Testament where God dwelt with his people. And now fast forward a few thousand years later, boom, Jesus comes into the picture. Emmanuel, God with us. So he pitched his tent to be with us. Now here's what I love. This is not just this weird abstract reality. And like, imagine God from heaven being like, oh, I'm sorry guys, you guys are gonna have to figure it out. He didn't do that, right? He came to dwell among us. And this is what's beautiful about the Christmas story. You ready? In Jesus, we don't have just a deity to pray to. We have a savior with whom we can commune, a friend we can confide in, and a king we can truly know. And I love that, right? He's a personal God. In fact, I want to offer you a few myths that usually we tend to believe about the Christmas story. The first myth is that Jesus came to shatter the myth that God is distant. And for a lot of us, that means a lot. Jesus came to shatter the myth that God is distant. Think about it. Jesus didn't stay separated from us looking from this lofty throne in the heavens. Instead, he came close to us as close as the person who you're sitting next to. He walked our dusty roads. He felt our struggles and shared in the fullness of the human experience. In Jesus, God put a face to his name and he walked among us. Beautiful truth. So that's the first myth. The second myth is that Jesus came to shatter the myth that God is unapproachable that God is unapproachable. Now, I want you to consider this, and only those of you who have been at a, at a hospital, especially mothers and parents, you would know this. Jesus came as a newborn baby. There's nothing more unapproachable and vulnerable than coming in that condition. Jesus decided and chose to arrive in the most humble and vulnerable way, inviting others to his side. He welcomed the outcast. Think about this. 
He loved aiding with sinners, and he took time to speak to the forgotten of the society. In Jesus, we see a guy who invites us to draw closer to us. And the third myth is that Jesus came to shatter the myth that God is impersonal, that God is impersonal. Now, I want you to consider this. Think about the, the life and ministry of Jesus. The Bible says that he wept with people, he rejoiced with people, he probably laughed and, and had fun with people. He offered compassion and healing. His interactions were so personal. He knew people's stories. He knows the most intrinsic, private, secret aspect of each and every one of us today. He knows each and every one of our names because he's a personal God. Now you're thinking, okay, what do we do with that? Like, okay, it's cute and everything, but what do we do with that? The fact that Jesus came to dwell among us should also be an invitation for us to become active participants in this divine fellowship. You know, here's a hard truth for a lot of us, but God is not really impressed with your church attendance, right? You might come on a weekly basis faithfully, but that doesn't really mean anything, anything if you're not sharing in this divine fellowship with Jesus. It's up to us to take advantage of his presence through the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. So the question that I'm gonna ask you is how, what are you doing to commune with Jesus? Are you seeking him in the scriptures? Are you experiencing the fullness of his life? And the question for us is, are we gonna accept the invitation to walk with Jesus, to talk to him, to truly get to know him? Because one of the things that we do on Christmas is acknowledge Jesus in a way, essentially, but I just don't want you to acknowledge the presence of Jesus. I want you to embrace it, engage it, and I want you to let it transform it. <coughs> so Jesus came to dwell among us, number one. Number two, Jesus came to save us. Jesus came to save us. I want you to look at what the angel told Mary and Joseph in verse 11 of Luke chapter two. Today in the town of David, a what? A savior has been born to you, he is the Messiah, the Lord. Now mothers in the room, I want you to imagine this. You are the doctor for a routine checkup and the doctor leans in and he goes, congratulations, your son is gonna be the next president of the United States. You probably think brothers on drugs, but that's the kind of surprise that Mary got, but on a divine level. <coughs> this angel told her child will be the savior of the world. No pressure, right? But notice what the angel doesn't say. Today in the town of David, a judge has been born to you. I'm not making it up. You can look in your scripture. Or today in the town of David, a national hero has been born to you. He uses the word what? Savior. Savior. Well, if you're new here this morning, we're so glad you're here. Really, we are so glad that you've decided to come on a Sunday morning but it would be very responsible for me to tell you the good news without telling you the bad news, right? And the bad news is that you're a sinner. Imagine if I just said, you're a sinner, let's pray out. And we just went home like that, so depressing. The truth is that you're a sinner and I am a sinner. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned with no exception and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, you've missed the mark. And the bad news get worse when you realize there's nothing that you can do and I can do to fix that issue. It's like realizing you've been trying to clean a massive ink stain with a dry paper towel. You can scrub all you want, right? But you're still gonna be left out with smudged hands and a stained cloth. Now let me do a quick parenthesis here to recognize the brokenness that a lot of us are experiencing here in the room. Maybe you're here today, you're experiencing the heartache of a marriage ending where relationships have crumbled. Maybe you just recently missed or lost a loved one or the incredible and profound grief of miscarriage. These are real struggles, right? These are real struggles. And they weigh heavily on a heart, especially on a season where joy is expected. It's like you're supposed to be happy during this season, right? What if I'm not? What if I'm not experiencing the fullness of joy that I'm supposed to experience as a follower of Jesus? What if I'm actually experiencing grief and disappointment and confusion? Recently, I got to sit down with a family member and 
He shared about the tough season that he's stepping into. And around this table, there were tears. Because we recognize that a lot of us are walking through the dark night of the soul. We recognize that we live in a broken world that has been ruined by sin. Maybe you're experiencing that. I don't know your life, and I have no idea what you're going through. But maybe you are experiencing a heavy heart today. And I want you to know if that's you today, that your pain is seen, that your struggle is known, and it's okay to not be okay. We come to church sometimes with this max, this facade of everything is great. And we're smiling and we're greeting people even though we want to punch everybody in the face. And, and we just want to go home and cry and just hide in a corner for the rest of our lives. And that's normal in the human experience because this world has been tainted by sin. And I want you to know that it's okay to not be okay. Yet as we even recognize the depth of our pain and the reality of our brokenness, we are pointed to the good news of Jesus, right? Now here's the thing, good news is only good news to people who know that they need good news. So if I give you $10, it's extremely good for a poor person, but will not even get noticed by a rich man. And guess what, we're all that poor person in the story. Now here are the good news of the gospel story. Listen to this. Jesus came, he lived among us, and he shows us the depth of God's love. But he didn't step there. He took upon himself the weight of our sin and carried them to the cross. And there, in the most profound act of love, he died to pay a debt we could never settle in our own. Incredible. Yet the Bible tells us that death could not hold him. He triumphed over the grave, resurrecting to offer us not just a second chance, but a new life. And this is the full message of the gospel, a path to forgiveness and a bridge to God and the promise of eternal life to all who believe. Notice what the apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy 1:15. This is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to what? Save sinners. You, me, to save sinners and I'm the worst of them all. Notice what Paul didn't say. Jesus came to what? Endorse a political leader or Jesus came to offer you success or earthly material possessions. No, he came into the world to save sinners. If you look at his life and his ministry, if you've ever read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to realize that his life and his ministry revolve around this mission to seek, to seek, and to save the lost. He sought us first. We didn't come to him first. He sought us and saved us from his humble birth in a manger to his sacrificial death to his triumphant resurrection. Every step was taken in pursuit of this goal. Incredible. Man, if you're here this morning and you feel unworthy because you see people, you see me wearing a shirt and tucked in, my wife dressed me this morning, and you're like, everybody's smiling, people are raising their hands, people are getting baptized, but I feel unworthy. And I feel like I don't deserve to be here. Maybe that, that's you. I want to remind you that nobody's too far from the reach of God's grace. I'm serious. Nobody, not even you who maybe have done the worst of the worst in this world. Maybe you've gone to jail. Maybe you were addicted to certain things. Maybe you're still addicted to something. Maybe you're going through a hard season of your life. I want to remind you, nobody's too far from the reach of God's grace. The Bible says that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It doesn't say if you go to church every week, if you go to seminary, if you go to Bible school, if you leave worship, if you do that, he says, if you, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the, from the dead, he says, you will be saved. It doesn't say you might be saved. It says you will be saved. I'm serious, the worst decision that you can make here today, and I'm speaking to non-believers and believers at the same time, but the worst decision that you can make today is to leave this auditorium the same way you entered. So I pray that you've been praying and asking God to change your heart. Because again, we don't come here just to, to watch a performance. We come here to encounter a living God and to, to be active participants of the change that he's progressively doing in our hearts. 
So number one, Jesus came to dwell among us, to be around us. Number two, Jesus came to save us. And lastly, number three, Jesus came to offer us peace. Jesus came to offer us peace. I love that. Now, Christmas is always a nostalgic uh, season for my family and I. To give you some context, I grew up with two sisters. One of them, my, one of my sisters named Belen, had, had walked away from Jesus and, and made very bad choices in her life. Now, when I lived in Chile, I worked at a fast food chain called Bob's Burgers at the food court of a mall. We sold burgers, by the way. <laughs> Worst job I've ever had. And I vividly remember, and I will never forget, that Friday night when I was at work, that I saw my sister Belen sitting in the middle of the food court with some friends with a blank stare, gazing at the floor. And I can see from far away, she seemed lost. Until this day, 11 years later, I always wonder what would have happened if I would have come up to my sister that night. And I say this because that was the last time I saw my sister alive. She took her life that night. Four days after Christmas, December 29 of 2012. And if I'm honest with you, for so many years of my life, I carry so much guilt. I'm serious. I, I carry so much guilt because I wondered what would have happened if I would have come up to her and told her I love you or gave her a hug and tell her I'm here for you. And I shared this with you because for the next three Christmases after that, that's all I could think about. I didn't care about Jesus, I'm, if I'm honest with you. And I'm a, I, was, I was a pastor kid. I didn't care about Jesus. I didn't care he came to offer us peace. I didn't care that we're supposed to be celebrating his presence during this, this season. I couldn't care any less. I was carrying so much guilt and I lost all hope. Maybe your story is similar here today. Maybe you are confused. Maybe you're disappointed and you're you're kind of figuring out why God allowed you to enter into this messy season. And I have no idea what you're going through. I'm serious, I have no idea. And you know, we sometimes like to think that we as pastors know what you guys are going through. We don't. I have no idea what you're going through. And, and if I wanna, if that's you today, if you're confused and disappointed and, and struggling with your faith, I wanna say, I'm sorry. I want you to know that you're so loved and cared for by a God who wants to wrap his arms around you today. And that's not something that I invented. It's from God's word. In fact, look at what verse 14 of Luke chapter 2 says. Glory to God. Literally, the angels are surrounding Jesus in that moment. All the attention, the heavenly attention is in that place right there in Bethlehem. Glory to God. They're singing in the highest heaven and on earth what? Peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now, I want you to understand, I want you to enter into the story. Luke is not necessarily writing with people in Muscatine in mind for the next 2,000 years. He's, he's writing to a lot of Jews in that time. So for the mind of a first century Jew, this concept of peace would have resonated differently. Remember that they live under the hard and heavy hand of the Roman Empire, and they were yearning not just for personal peace, but for national liberation. They wanted to free from oppression and, and ultimately he wanted somebody to restore their kingdom, their view of their kingdom. But Jesus came to offer something way better, something incredibly greater. He came to offer a peace that wasn't just about political stability. He brought a peace that could reconcile a broken relationship between humanity and God and to offer a sense of wholeness that no earthly power could. Earlier, I told you the story of the deer hitting my car. But what I left out from that story is how frustrated I was. I was so frustrated. I changed the Christmas radio into metal because I was so angry. <laughs> and I remember I got home and I started complaining about everything to my wife, Ashley, bless her heart. I told her, you know, I'm so frustrated. I started complaining. I'm gonna have to call the insurance company. I'm gonna have to file a claim. We're gonna have to spend money to fix the car. Insurance is a scam. If you're an insurance agent, I was angry, okay? But you know what she did? You know what she did? She gave me a hug. She gave me a hug. When she should have punched me in the face to start acting like a jerk, she just gave me a hug. 
And I can picture God doing the same. Like while we're kicking and screaming and, and fuming and letting our frustration and our anger, he doesn't interrupt us with a lecture or he doesn't walk away and disappointed. He just gives us a hug. He wrapped his arms around us, letting that simple act of love dissolve the tension and replacing our worry with peace. It's kind of a hug that says, I've got you. Beautiful. I've got you. So Jesus came to dwell among us, to be close to us. Jesus came to save us. That's the reality of the gospel, ladies and gentlemen. If you're here today and you think that you graduated from the gospel, of Jesus, let me tell you that you're completely mistaken. Every single day we need to preach to our souls that we have been saved by a God instead of giving us what we deserve, which is his wrath for all of eternity. The message of salvation. And number three, Jesus came to offer us peace. A peace that no social media is gonna give you or relationship is gonna give you, right? I've never met anybody that after scrolling through social media goes, wow, I really needed that. Right? But think about spending time in scripture, praying with him, meditating, contemplating his beauty. That gives us peace. Now, where do we go from here? Right? That sounds good. John is cute and everything, took some notes, whatever. But where do we go from here? And I'm not going to ask you to go downtown and feed the homeless and share the gospel with everyone you see, unless, even though that's incredible, and we need to do that, by the way. We want to reach our community with the gospel. But what I really want you to do is to ask yourself a question for the next 24 hours until tomorrow. And as you start work, as you go back to school, whatever you go do, how am I preparing my heart this Christmas? I'm serious. How are you answering that question? I cannot answer that for you. I know that for me, there's a lot of distractions, right? How am I preparing my heart this Christmas? And I have a challenge for you. You ready? I'm gonna ask you to read one chapter a day from the book of Luke. By the way, last night I was reading my notes to my wife and she's phenomenal. And then I finished the sermon and I'm like, this is amazing, right? And she goes, yeah, but you know, this, this, what, what are you gonna tell people to do? Are you just gonna preach this sermon and what are you gonna ask them to do? And so I went upstairs and started crying in my room and start writing the application. And I said, you're right. What are we gonna do about it as a church? So I want us to read the Gospel of Luke, one chapter a day for the next few days until Christmas. So if I did the math right, the Gospel of Luke has 24 chapters. Today is December 3rd. So if you start Luke chapter two tonight, yeah, you can skip chapter one. You will finish on December 25th, or you can read two chapters tonight. And I promise you that this exercise will be way more rewarding than watching Hallmark or whatever you do during Christmas. I'm serious, there's no greater investment than gathering your family around to engage with God's word. And in fact, by engaging with the Gospel of Luke, you will be applying the three points that we talked about. As you engage, if you're exposed to the beauty of scripture, you're gonna realize that Jesus is among us, that he's speaking to us, that he's close to us, that he's approachable, that he's personal, that he's not distant as you engage with God's word. When you make the journey through the Gospel of Luke or, or whatever you wanna read from scripture, go ahead, but you would encounter the redemptive plan for humanity, which is Jesus coming to save us. There's no book that you're gonna read from scripture Maybe a few that are questionable, like Song of Solomon. But there's no book that you're going to read and realize, wow, this is God's plan for humanity to save us. And finally, as you read, finish this reading, on December 25th, I can promise you that God will use the study of his word to give you peace. Again, let go from social media, from your phone, electronic device, TV, Fox News, whatever you watch, and start penetrating your heart with the truth of God's word. Because you know, it's so fun to, to, to get the house looking festive with tree lights and going to parties and, and, and baking cookies. And I love all of that, it's amazing, I enjoy that. But let's make sure we're also leaving room for the story of Jesus. Because remember, this celebration, he's, this birthday, right? It's not about us, it's about what? It's about Jesus, right? It's about Jesus. Let's pray. 
Dear God, we gather here today once again to ask for forgiveness for the ways in which we have become complacent in our faith. Lord, maybe there's so many distractions. We, we're looking forward to something and then a deer hits us or something happens. And, and then with all the inconveniences of the everyday life, we become distracted of what truly matters, Jesus. So help us know the purpose of why you came. Thank you because you came to dwell among us, Lord, to literally pitch a tent in our neighborhood. Lord, thank you because you came to save us and thank you because you came to offer us the peace that nobody else, that nothing else can offer us. So as we sing, as we go home, Jesus, could you you please penetrate our hearts with your truth? Lord, we love you, God. We love you for what you've done in our lives. And there's somebody here, Lord, that doesn't know you. Would you touch the heart? Would you touch, would you knock the door of their heart so that they would be open to receive you and to be saved by you so that we would be brothers and sisters for all of eternity? We love you, Jesus, and we pray all these things. Amen. Hey, I'm, I'm gonna invite you to stand and we're gonna finish this time together singing.